Myelofibrosis is one of myeloproliferative neoplasms, a chronic disease of the bone marrow. It is unfortunately the aggressive type. It does affect the life expectancy of the patients. The average survival is about five to seven years. Unlike other myeloproliferative neoplasms, and the name implies that these myeloid cells, that the bone marrow cells, grow without control and overwhelm the bone marrow and blood. In myelofibrosis, we have a reaction to the presence of malignant cells in terms of a production of certain cytokines in a bone marrow by bone marrow stroma that leads to a formation of the fibers in a bone marrow. So it's a reactive process that uh, is limiting the growth of the cells. And the primary problem with myelofibrosis is not usually too many cells, then too few cells, and the reaction of a body to a malfunctioning bone marrow by increasing the size of the spleen. About 80 to 90 percent of the patients have very big spleen, and the liver can also be enlarged in about 40 percent of the patients. So malfunctioning bone marrow, anemia in some patients, low platelets, low white cell count, coupled with a very large spleen, enlarged of the liver, and very poor quality of life. Bone aches and pains, night sweating, low-grade fevers, itching, night sweating, fatigue, weakness, cachexia, and patients uh, don't do well. These three factors together affect the, the patients and the survival is short. Now, so it's a disease that we would perhaps even call chronic leukemia. Many patients come and say, is it cancer? Yes, it is a cancer. It does kill people. It's not benign even cancer. It is a, a chronic uh, disease that shortens life expectancy. So sometimes it's uh, confusing just because we use a myelofibrosis as a name, which is a description of a bone marrow itself. The underlying biological problem is hyperactivity of a JAK-SAT pathway, as is in other myeloproliferative neoplasms, essential thrombocytemia and polycythemia vera. There are reasons for this uh, intracellular signaling pathway to be active and leads to a disease that is mutations, and the three, what we call perhaps incorrectly, but we call them driver mutations that lead to hyperactivity of the jak pathway are exclusive of each other by and large. These are jak 2 v 617 f color reticulin mutation, and meeple mutation. These three mutations lead to hyperactivity of jak pathway as uniform biological abnormality in every patient and even if you don't test patients for any of these driver mutations, which is advisable as a part of the diagnostic process, but if you can do that, you know that there is a hyperactivity of jak pathway in that patient. Myelofibrosis is uh, part of the constellation of diseases known as the chronic myeloproliferative disorders. Uh, it's an interesting disease. It has a, a chronicity to it, thus the name. Uh, patients can have a wide range of uh, clinical outcome. That is, it can be a very indolent disease going on decades, or it can be a disease that is rapidly progressive. Uh, it's unclear exactly as to what specifically uh, uh, demarcates a patient with rapidly progressive versus advanced disease, but some of the molecular markers have been shown to be prognostic. Uh, for example, uh, in addition to the principal causes or the drivers of the myelofibrosis, which include JAK2, uh, MPL or MIPL as it's called, or calreticulin, CLR mutations, additional mutations such as ASXL1, for example, uh, has been shown to be a worsening or a uh, predictor of more advanced disease. Uh, in addition, in terms of the clinical uh, characteristics that uh, demarcate a patient who is likely to have more aggressive or more advanced disease uh, include patients with uh, rapidly enlarging spleen size, uh, patients who have increased circulating blast, that tends to be a big issue, uh, specifically in patients who end up progressing to acute leukemia. And the other issues, at least the one that I find in my clinical practice that are particularly worrisome, are patients who develop constitutional symptoms early in the course of their disease. And what I say about that is uh, constitutional symptoms including uh, fevers, uh, pruritus, but the one that I find to be the most troubling is early satiety leading to weight loss. Once that starts to develop, uh, patients tend to have a more rapid decline. Progression of the disease is a problem. About 20% of the patients with myelofibrosis do change to acute myeloid leukemia. We can't really predict very well who will or who will not transform at the beginning. But we do have otherwise some knowledge about the outcome of the patients. Apart from the transformation to acute myeloid leukemia, 
which happens in a 20% of patients. Other patients die from the myeloid fibrosis itself. The cause of that may be liver failure because liver infiltration, pulmonary hypertension because pulmonary infiltration, cardiac failure because cardiac output goes up, bleeding from the GI tract related to portal hypertension, cachexia, bleedings, thrombosis, infections, multiple different factors. It's difficult to say one factor leads to death. But we have tools, prognostic factors, that uh, are something that we do implement at the beginning when we diagnose patients with myeloid fibrosis to assess the risk of dying. Not related to transformation, but otherwise dying from the disease itself. And there are five factors usually that are implemented, going from the age over 60, having a blast in blood, hemoglobin less than 10, white cell count over 25, or having systemic symptoms, particularly low-grade fevers, night sweating, and weight loss. And we can divide patients in four different groups. Low risk, have none of the five. Intermediate one, one of the five. Intermediate two risk of dying, two out of five. And then high risk of dying earlier on if they have three, four, or five of these factors. Now, the years of life that we are talking about range from 11 years for a low risk, eight years for intermediate one, four years for intermediate two, two for high risk. The primary reason for assessment of risk of dying is uh, to see whether we can, if the transplant is a possibility, to refer a patient for the transplant. That is usually applicable for younger and fit patients, but we do this quite often, even in older people. At MD Anderson Cancer Center, we do transplant up to 75 years of age. So we utilize a risk assessment of dying and patients that have intermediate two or high risk disease, so life expectancy two to four years, we try to do a transplant if possible. 